thumbs up. Super. Okay. Um, uh, the CARES guide book that has been put together here is a, a product of the New Energy Nexus Open Office Program. Our Open Office Program is really um, a mentor and co coaching program, which we are now going to, well, historically for the last year, we've been doing it only with our funded portfolio companies, of which there are, are 68. Uh, we're now going to, as of today, open up Open Office to any clean economy company uh, that would. Um, find those types of uh, 60 minute sessions valuable. So um, that's, we're going to get to that later. Um, I've had some tremendous partnerships on the bringing this information together. I've mentioned Craig Teague uh, before, but also Olivia Heights, who is an associate at New Energy Nexus has done some great work here. Um, and of course, our friends at KPMG have been contributors, but also the SBA lenders um, who are under an incredible amount of stress uh, have been open and forthcoming with a lot of really important information, which we hope you'll find actionable by the conclusion of this hour. Let me go over to here and forward the slide. So just a quick summary, um, New Energy Nexus is a 15-year-old nonprofit organization. So our dog in the hunt is you. Um, we want to make sure that you are successful. Um, we've mobilized about $1.5 billion of capital over our 15 years of uh, the organization. To the best of our knowledge, we are the largest non-governmental non grant maker to diverse clean economy entrepreneurs around the globe. Um, that is a great achievement in such a short amount of time. Um, we welcome additional capacity from any parties that feel they'd like to work with us. Our vision and mission are quite clear. Um, we support diverse entrepreneurs to drive innovation and build equity into the global clean economy. Safe Harbor, um, I think I can thank uh, Craig for this one. Uh, I am not a lawyer nor an accountant, um, but good thing is Craig is a lawyer and our friends from KPMG are uh, lawyers. But this information is strictly for educational purposes. Um, you should seek your own counsel um, when taking decisions. So let me introduce Craig. Uh, again, I have uh, uh, yeah, some really good experience with Craig and, and DLA Piper at large. Um, they've been a great partner to New Energy Nexus. As I said before, we've worked together on the Easy OZ program, um, which was an Opportunity Zone finance program. Um, you can go and visit at your leisure. Um, he is a, a Stanford person, um, but been a partner for 27 years. Is it right, Craig? 27 years at DLA? That's correct. Great. So here's the agenda. Um, what the heck is CARES? Um, then we're going to do an overview of the particular piece that we think is most applicable to our community. It's not limited to that. So we plan to do additional um, discovery around the other parts of it, which uh, Olivia is going to illuminate some of those portions. We're going to talk about eligibility, mostly driven through our conversation with Craig. Uh, calculating our PPP loan size and also how you gain 100% forgiveness, uh, and then what we believe is the best path for action going forward. So that's generally the agenda. So now I have to go to unmute Olivia. Olivia, are you on? Olivia. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Yep. Thanks, John. So again, I'm just going to reiterate that we've been digging through a lot of info, a lot of the noise to try to provide the highest quality actionable info for entrepreneurs to continue their work in the clean economy. And so we to go over what is CARES, CARES, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act. It's a third phase of stimulus at two trillion dollars. And we're going to go into the exact amounts that each of the programs that we found were the best options for the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs were um, at, in the later slides. But the major pieces of this legislature that we pulled out for small businesses out of over 680 pages um, were the Paycheck Protection Program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan and the advance associated with it, and the Employee Retention Credit. And after this was after talking with SBA lenders and lawyers and reviewing the rules released by the Treasury Department and the Small Business Association. After all of this review, we have identified the Paycheck Protection Program 
as the best and first option for funding for entrepreneurs. And a quick note before I pass it back over to John, if you take the Paycheck Protection Program loan, the PPP, or the EIDL, you are ineligible for the employee retention credit. And vice versa, if you decide to take this tax credit, the fully refundable tax credit for employers, you will no longer be eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program or the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. It's an either or, and we think it's important for our CEOs to know. All right, I'm gonna pass it back over to John for a deep dive into the Paycheck. That was great. Uh, Olivia has done a lot of work on this, and what we were seeing is um, there's a lot of information out there, and so we wanted to really boil it down to something that was directly actionable by our CEOs. I want to get a little bit into what this is. I mean, $350 billion is a gobsmacking amount of money. Um, this is only a portion of the $2 trillion. Um, and so this money is one slice of a multiple-layer program. And as Olivia just mentioned, there are other parts, EIDL and also um, the ERC. We'll get into those in, in, in later um, conversation, but we think that this is the uh, one to focus on immediately. And I'm just going to throw out a couple of things that are important. Um, maybe I'll start with the bottom, is that this is a loan uh, that must pass through an SBA lender, a small business association lender. Um, and it can be 100% forgiven. It doesn't require any personal guarantees or collateral, and it has no fees associated to the lending party. Um, that is all going to be covered by the federal government. So this is a mechanism by which the federal treasury has decided to use the SBA lending network to push a large amount of capital through, and they will pay the fees. So they, being the federal agency, will pay the fees to the SBA lender. So you, as the party that's receiving the loan, don't have to pay any of those fees. And you, as the lending party, don't have to put up any collateral nor personal guarantees. Uh, there's also a potential for a six-month interest payment deferral. And if you do this right, you're never even going to get to that point. Uh, loan maturity is two years, so they're very short loans. And it's a 1% fixed rate of interest maximum of up to 10 million but because most of our companies are investing let's say less than one million dollars per month um, in 2019 average i don't suspect that we're going to be anywhere close to that in any single lending party um, this is a first come first serve 350 billion kind of think about that for a second but it is first come first serve um, and the capacity is uh, being applied for very, very rapidly. Um, the numbers on how fast this money is being applied for is really mushy at this point. We've heard that uh, Wells Fargo closed their application window Sunday night because when they opened it for a very brief amount of time, it just got filled up. But we'll get to that in a little bit. So you'd say to yourself, okay, so they're telling us that the payment protection program is the best first option here and that I can get a loan for my business and then I can have it forgiven entirely. I don't have to pay any fees and I don't give any personal guarantees or collateral. That sounds pretty good. Now, here's the trick or multitudes of tricks, but uh, here's a trick and I'm gonna hand it off to Craig now to talk a bit about eligibility because as uh, startups, uh, you may have some snags in here. So Craig, can you see the slides? Yes, I can. Fantastic. Okay, I'll, I'll leave you to it. So first, um, as, as John indicated, this is a very attractive loan uh, structure. Uh, you probably can't get anything like this anywhere else, anywhere else in the world. But if you have an existing lender and you have um, a loan agreement that has negative covenants that would restrict your ability to incur uh, new indebtedness, uh, notwithstanding the great terms and, and the likelihood or probability of complete forgiveness of the loan, you will have to get consent from your existing lender. Uh, what we've found in the last week or so is that <clears throat> the lenders are willing to consider um, allowing their borrowers to uh, apply for the PPP loans since, frankly, it's in their interest to um, uh, have liquidity injected rapidly into their borrowers, but they are imposing some conditions. Uh, what we're seeing is that they want some level of assurance that 
the loan will be entirely or some significant portion of it will be forgiven because it's not absolutely certain at the outset when you get the loan <clears throat> that you will satisfy all the criteria for full uh, forgiveness. Um, so as, as John indicated, uh, you, you do have to meet eligibility standards. Uh, you have to be in operation February 15th of this year. The, the, the next big issue is you have to have fewer than 500 employees, and that's a test uh, uh, count of full and part-time employees. It's not a, a full-time equivalent analysis. It's, it's, just, it's a raw head count. Um, the, there are some exceptions that are not going to be applicable to the audience on this uh, conference, so I will not go into those. But on the 500 employees, the thing that has uh, created the most concern in the venture community and the private equity community is the SBA's affiliate rules, which are designed to avoid having what are really large enterprises uh, get, take advantage of SBA programs, which are supposed to be focused on small businesses. So the, if you have an investor who is deemed an affiliate under the rules that the SBA has now declared, they've been clarifying this issue over the last few days, um, that is in fact an affiliate, what happens then is you have to count the um, investors, employees, and more importantly, the uh, employees of the investors other portfolio companies. So that could obviously um, easily push you over the 500 limit if you have a venture capital or other institutional investor who has a large portfolio. The what the what the S, what the SBA has come back and said is what's what's the test for an affiliate for an investor, and they've they've gone with a simpler test than their traditional one uh, that they use for a lot of the other loans, and it's basically the following. Um, does the investor have more than 50% of the voting securities, either ownership or control? Or if it's a minority investor, does it either at the board level or at the shareholder level have the ability to block what are deemed really day-to-day -day decision making um, by the company? And that can take a couple of forms. One would be if the at the board level, if the uh, investor has their ability by not having its designated director show up at a meeting to prevent a quorum so that the board can't act, or at the board level, having uh, what are viewed as day-to-day -day decisions uh, about the company, and I can go into that a little bit, uh, decide uh, that, that that decision can only be approved by a majority vote that must include that specific director. At the shareholder level, it's the, again the question: Can this can that investor block uh, the the shareholders from having a quorum for a meeting, or does it have a veto power through its share owning uh, ownership over um, what are viewed as day to day decisions? Um, it's not an insuperable problem uh, because the SBA has now uh, agreed with what the approach that. Uh, firms like ours have been taking over the last week or so, which is that if we, when we go through and comb through the charter documents and the shareholder agreements and the like, if we determine that an investor has any of those powers that even as a minority shareholder would make them an affiliate, the SBA has agreed that if the investor uh, executes an irrevocable waiver of those rights, or if the uh, investor agrees to an amendment of the document to take away that right, i.e. You, you, you amend your certificate of incorporation uh, to eliminate this veto power, that will be sufficient to eliminate that investor as an affiliate. Um, in terms of the kind of decisions that the uh, SBA views as impermissible in terms of turning an investor into uh, an affiliate, it's um, things such as uh, determining employee compensation, ability to hire or fire executives, um, the setting up uh, or amending your employee stock option plans, uh, entering into uh, loan agreements, purchasing equipment, uh, making changes in the budget, decisions about whether or not to bring a lawsuit or defend a lawsuit, or um, decisions relating to, <clears throat> excuse me, 
um, hiring and firing executives. Uh, so, you know, if you're if you're applying for the PPP, um, you should sift through your your documents and see if there are any issues on that front. And if there are, go ahead and have that investor uh, or investor group, if there's multiple investors with these veto rights, uh, go ahead and give you a waiver letter so that you can go forward and uh, make your application. So then the question becomes, um, let's see, I, I apologize, I'm not following uh, the slides here, I've been working off my notes. So then the question becomes, how do you calculate uh, what you're entitled to as the size of the loan? And the size is going to be determined Craig, by Craig, let uh, me taking. Craig, let me, let yeah, me interrupt sure. for a moment. Um, I, I, I want to get to. Uh, I, you may or may not see the the the, the slides right now, but we're on the uh, required documents slide, which I think might be important for um, what you're seeing as a practitioner in these types of deals. What are some of the core documents that the counterparty, the SBA lender, is requiring from you? to transact efficiently, um, you know, the sort of the documentation around 2019 payroll costs and things like this? Well, the SBA has now said that you can, you, you, what, what uh, John is getting at is you take 12 months of average payroll and you come up with the <clears throat> average monthly and then you uh, multiply that by two and a half times and that gives you your maximum loan amount as long as it's less than uh, $10 million. Um, the SBA has now said that you can use either measure the 12 months either for calendar 2019 or the 12 month period that precedes the date of your application. So obviously you would pick the one that is more favorable, but they now have um, they issued a pronouncement last night that does give you the ability to use either 12 month period. That's great. Um, now, I think that Orla is on, or maybe Tom West is on from KPMG, or if not, that's fine. Just say hello if you are. Hey, John, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hey. <laughs> hey, great. Okay. Um, do you all want to talk about the sizing of the loan or do you want to talk about the forgiveness or do we not want to do that? Do you want us, you just, Real quick. I would love to hear your um, insights on the <laughs> sizing. I mean, I guess on the tax side, the, the two points that I would just offer up and want to make sure everyone's aware of. Um, oh, and I think Tom may be on also, but we need to unmute him um, somehow, John. Working on it. Under Theo West, if you, if you see him. Got him. Um, okay, he's unmuted now. Go ahead. Hey, hey Tom, John. you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, hey, John. Hi. Hey, Orla. Sorry to the crowd for uh, joining late here. Um, so as, as the slide you have up mentions, your loan size is limited to $10 million or the lesser of 2.5 times your monthly payroll costs. The payroll cost definition is fairly generous, I think, um, although it does cut off at $100,000 per employee. So under the SBA rules, an employee who's making on an annualized basis more than $100,000 in compensation, meaning wages, uh, commissions, bonus, you would cut that person off at $100,000 and take two and a half times their monthly payroll. So for an individual who's making $100,000 or more, the wage portion of their loan is going to be, I think, it, I think it comes out to $20,833. Now, on top of that, for each of those people, regardless of whether or not they are over the $100,000, you can also take into consideration the monthly average of all the other benefits that you're paying them. So that includes you know, um, insurance premiums for healthcare, retirement benefits, paid time off, sick leave, anything like that, severance pay. You wanna take all of that into account, everything that you've paid in payroll over the last 12 months, and um, divide that by 12 and then multiply it by two and a half. That's how you're gonna figure out your payroll size. Um, a lot of questions have been asked because there was some strange language in the statute that said, the one thing you don't include in payroll costs are um, federal withholdings during the covered period, the covered period for these purposes being 
February 15th through June 30th, 2020. So any um, basically employee withholding um, on federal, of federal taxes, so the FICA portion of your taxes. Um, some guidance came out from Treasury the other day that actually kind of walks you through the calculation. And most people now, the general consensus is you're gonna take your gross payroll amount. So include your federal taxes, include everything except for during that covered period in your calculation. So that's how you're gonna size your loan. Yeah, that's um, great, Tom. And, and just as a reminder to everyone listening, both Craig at DLA Piper and Tom and Orla at KPMG <laughs> are literally in the trench practicing this right now. And so anything that they're giving us here is direct experience, um, you know, insight. And, and we're very grateful for you all to be in, uh, imbuing the, the, the knowledge into this community. So thank you. Let me advance this slide here and talk about forgiveness because this is can, can really I, quite- uh, John, Can I just jump in with two things that have been coming up as questions yeah. uh, on the uh, county? Uh, one is the SBA has now taken the position uh, that if you have independent contractors working with you, you cannot count what you've paid them in, during that 12-month period for calculating your payroll. Uh, initially, it looked like they would allow that, but they've, they've come down firmly that you can't do that. The other question that's come up uh, with, where they did come out okay with us is uh, a lot of startups we work with use um, payroll providers or professional employer organizations to handle the infrastructure of their employer employers. And the SBA has said that those, um, the folks that are on the, those payroll arrangements, you can include their wages and compensation uh, when you go to calculate uh, your average payroll during that 12 month period. So a little bad, a little good. Okay, that's, that's helpful, Craig. Thank you for that. Um, and that would that would be you know workforce expansion types of organizations, right? Like a, a you know like temp work, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I've advanced the slide, um, Tom. If you want to talk about loan forgiveness, and of course, as always, Craig, feel free to add some color. Yeah, very very happy to. So this is the really um, tantalizing part of the payment. Paycheck Protection Program, uh, to the extent you get one of these loans, and we talked about the size the loan could be, to the extent you take the proceeds you receive, in the eight-week period after you get the loan, if you spend the proceeds on payroll, which is defined the same way I just defined it in, in calculating loan, so on employees less than $100,000 on an annualized basis, so you spend it on payroll, rent or mortgage expense, or utilities, that amount will be forgiven. And that forgiveness is not going to be cancellation of debt. It's going to be tax, um, it's not going to be taxable under the provisions of the CARES Act statute. So that's really powerful. You essentially transform that amount of your loan, which for many people might be the full amount of the loan, into a grant. Um, there are a few limitations on that uh, that you have to keep in mind. While it doesn't say this in the statute, the guidance that Treasury and SBA put out last week said that 75% of that uh, of the payments you make in that eight-week period have to go toward payroll expense. I think they were worried uh, that this program is going to be oversubscribed, and so they wanted to make sure they were driving more of these of, of the, these forgiveness amounts into payroll costs. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is to the extent that you've had a reduction in workforce or you've cut salaries of employees who are making less than $100,000 a year by more than 25% during the February to June period, you're going to have to, during the eight-week period you, you, uh, after you get this loan, they want you to restore your headcount and or restore any salary cuts you've made more than 25%. Um, if you don't do that, then some of this forgiveness of the loan will be haircut. One, one thing to quickly note again that may be applicable for some of the companies that are on uh, this uh, webinar is that the question has come up whether or not um, you can treat um, licensed payments to like a WeWorks or a similar outfit that provides desk space 
as rent that you can use the proceeds for. Our view is that, that while it's not absolutely clear, uh, it's a good faith, reasonable um, use of the money because you really are, it's, it's the equivalent of getting office space because you're getting desk space, use of common areas, conference rooms, things like that, which is the, you know, basically the equivalent of having leased uh, space. So um, if you are in that kind of situation, our view is that, that it would be reasonable to use proceeds for that purpose and to count that for purposes of the test that was that Theo just went through for the uh, forgiveness. The other thing to quickly note is that um, if you have a non-mortgage backed loan, um, you can use um, uh, proceeds for paying interest on that loan, but that would not be used in the calculation of the amount that's forgivable. Good point, Craig. Thank you for that. I'm um, gonna try to advance this slide. Okay, so as part of our work, and, and I know that uh, both Craig and Orla and, and Tom have all been deep in the weeds with several of these counterparties, I'm sure, um, we have a good relationship with uh, every single one of these SBA lenders. Um, we were disappointed to find that um, most SBA lenders were not interested in opening new accounts for folks. So if you didn't have an existing account with an SBA lender, um, there was uh, a lot of question as to how you were going to access this PPP program because many of the SBA lenders were absolutely flooded with existing customer interest in accessing this loan tool. Um, the PowerPoint from this presentation today will be available. Um, you can, we'll send it out to everybody so that you can access these links. But those are direct links to the apply now for each one of those banks. Um, as I said before, uh, Wells Fargo has closed their window um, because they say they're, they're uh, subscribed to their $10 billion budget for this um, particular tool. Um, you know, this is a very uh, fast moving environment right now. Uh, and I, we've already heard from um, several friends in Washington, D.C. that there is a, uh, they'll call it, uh, I think, four, uh, round four, which is additional funding. Um, any, would, would either Craig or Tom or Orla want to comment on their experience with SBA lenders? And um, these, are, these folks here are mission aligned with the clean economy. Um, are you seeing uh, other information out there that might be helpful to tune our, our folks in? Well, our SBA team in DC does expect a phase four, uh, and they have emphasized in our internal and external discussions that the SBA um, uh, employees and, and management are really energized by this program and do want to make it as flexible uh, and, and uh, efficient as possible. They are not looking to create roadblocks to prevent people from availing themselves of the, this program and the other ones that they are in charge of under the CARES Act. I, I just want to uh, throw in one quick note from a process standpoint uh, for folks, which is if you do get um, a PPP loan, uh, we advise you to put the money into a separate bank account than your regular operating account. Uh, you know, money is fungible. If you just put it into your regular bank account, um, it could create tracing problems in terms of demonstrating how the funds we use for purposes of the forgiveness component. And uh, based on the um, legislative back and forth when the CARES Act was being uh, debated and approved, uh, we do expect uh, government audits uh, for this program down the line. And so we want folks to create the best paper trail possible to demonstrate that it was right that they uh, had um, their loan uh, partially or completely forgiven. Great advice, Craig. Uh, Tom, anything more there that you'd like to talk about around your experience with the SBA lenders? Yeah, um, I agree with what Craig said. Listen, it's, it's certainly been chaotic uh, by all accounts, and we just have kind of anecdotal reports of what some of our clients have experienced. Um, people are actually having the most success with smaller community banks and 
um, some banks that they have pre-existing relationships with. Uh, hopefully, you know, you, you pointed to some of the developments in DC today, in addition to the idea of um, a 4.0 stimulus specifically injecting several hundred billion, potentially more uh, directly through the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, I know the Fed was making noise about stepping in and helping um, prop uh, but back the SBA programs to, to make some of the lenders more comfortable mm. um, take, taking stuff on their balance sheet. Um, and hopefully that will, um, that will grease the skids here, but I, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, having spoken with as many SBA lenders as we have in researching this and trying to provide the best information to our community, I agree with Craig in that these these parties are really interested in being a, a, a good tool. I think there was just a, a lot of uncertainty around certain parts of it and know your customer and anti-laundering and things like this that that was a hold up and you know the window opened on Friday and we heard some reports of enormous amounts of capital being applied for. Um, we've now heard that there have been some loans underwritten and there is money flowing. So this is all good. Um, and I go back to where I started this conversation today, which is thoughtful and thorough right now, but biased towards action. So I think that as the CEO of a clean economy company, you need to be talking with your current banking partner um, and finding out whether they are compliant and ready to do this type of business. And if they are, then great, get uh, your application in. Uh, but if you're not, then you have to find an SBA lender that would be willing to take a, a new party on. So uh, when we were creating this content, uh, and, and again, it's been an absolute flurry storm of information, and I apologize if you don't find this useful. I really hope you find it very useful. Um, the first action step we take is confirm your eligibility, back to what Craig was talking about. Uh, the second is calculate your, your loan. And you may need some outside help with that, but it's quite straightforward. So if you follow the rules, which are laid out, uh, you can calculate your loan size. And for many of our companies, let's say if you're doing a, you know, a million dollars of investment in average over 2019 per month, which would be a lot for our community, uh, you're still talking about a $2.5 million loan. You're nowhere near the cap. So um, you know, be aware of the amount of money you're chasing here. Uh, it's, it's, it's very meaningful, uh, but it's not you know, astronomical. Uh, get yourself prepared. Find an SBA lender. Select that lender. They each have individual SBA applications. So you go and do theirs uh, is uh, the advice that our SBA lenders have been telling us. So don't go to the SBA PPP application website uh, because some of them are not accepting that. Check with your SBA lender. They may say that that's okay, but just check with your particular lender. And then as Tom said, if you invest over eight weeks, this full amount of the loan into qualified investments, you have 100% loan forgiveness potential. And that's really quite amazing. It turns into a grant. So that means that you've just saved yourself or your balance sheet two and a half months of runway. Um, and in our world, uh, early stage clean economy startups, that is potentially another lifetime that you've given yourself. So I encourage you to consider this PPP tool. So in yeah, John, the, I just want to emphasize, uh, this is Craig, I just want to emphasize that uh, you still have to, uh, even if you do 100% uh, of the proceeds, commit 100% of the proceeds to qualified investments, you still have to apply the full-time equivalent test uh, yes. for that, the end of that eight week period against uh, a prior measuring period, which you can choose you, you, as a company, you can pick the uh, baseline uh, period, whichever one is better for you, either full-time equivalents on average from February 15th of 2019 to June 30th, 2019, or uh, January 1st of this year to February 29th of this year. Yep. And, that, and then you just do a fraction on that. Yep. Yeah. I mean, obviously the point that the treasury is trying to achieve here is to keep people employed at the same level as they were in 2019 or the designated period. So we've seen tremendous um, unemployment claims being filed. And, and that of course is a, a way to reverse it is to keep small businesses employing people as they were previous to this catastrophe. So that's a great point to, to raise. 
In the spirit of um, moving along, um, I will go quickly over this. Open Office is a program that we're opening it up to everyone as of today. Please email Jessica to schedule a time. Also, our Slack channel is a great way to remain in our community. Sign up there. Um, and let me go to the final slide here, which is Q&A. Um, uh, so, Olivia, I think you've been pulling questions. And Craig, thank you for jumping into that chat window and, and pulling some stuff out of there in real time. Were there things in the window, uh, Olivia, that we didn't address that could go to Tom or Craig uh, to get some response in real time here? Oops, I might have to unmute you. Are you unmuted? Hold on. Sorry. Uh, 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 so on, on the question from Ben is, unfortunately, independent contractors don't count. And the question from Power for All, confused about compensation in excess of 100,000. It's the Bay Area for 75% of my employees make more than 100,000. I think that got addressed, which is you take up to the $100,000 mark in terms of cash compensation to those executives. Anything in cash compensation above that amount is just excluded. And then, as, as previously mentioned, you still take the uh, non-cash portion of that compensation uh, like you would for employees who make less than 100,000 and, and roll that into the overall payroll calculation. Um, temp workers through an agency payroll for your total loan amount. Um, I, I have to check on that, but I think if you're just hiring temps, um, it, uh, it you may you, I think you you can include them, but I I need to confirm that with one of our employment lawyers. Yeah, and and I also want to uh, the power for all question here is it's a cap of a hundred thousand. You don't throw the employee out altogether off your roll. You just have to cap it at a hundred k. Right. That's that. That's right. that I think no. is that question there. Um, okay. I think we've gotten to most of these. Anyone that wants to dump a question in the everyone area, uh, please. Oh, okay. So Wendelin has something here. Uh, Craig or Tom, you want to take a look at that question there about 1099 independent contractors. And uh, we also have a question from Ramon Polin. That's right. I saw that one. Yes. About mortgage payments. So if you're, yeah, if, if you're an independent contractor, you can apply directly for your own PPP loan. And as of Friday, um, sole, pro sole proprietorships and independent contracts and like can submit applications. Uh, for Ramon's question, if there's a principal payment, uh, well, you, 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 you can make, you, you would not use the proceeds uh, to go towards the principal payment. You, you, you can't do that. You would just only uh, use uh, PPP loan proceeds to pay the interest component. And then there's a question about eligibility with a venture company in a decision-making position on the board. Now, um, the question here, Jake, is uh, eligibility. So, Craig, you want to take that one? I, I can jump in too, or, or Craig. Tom, whoever. Yeah. yeah. Well, no. So, so it's not it's simply the fact that let's just say, for example, you have a venture capital uh, investor that say owns twenty percent on a fully diluted basis, uh, and has a board representative, one of five directors. Um, unless um, that single director can prevent a quorum for purposes of a meeting, and unless that director has to be part of any board majority that approves actions that the SBA has deemed to be sort of day-to-day decision-making. Um, that's, that's not enough to render that venture capital firm that has put that representative on the board an affiliate under the uh, SBA's guidance that came out last week. Okay, and then a final question because we're getting into our hour. Um, Tom, you want to take this one about um, headcount and loan forgiveness and, and uh, that sort of thing? Sure. So when you're looking at your headcount and trying to figure out if your reduction in headcount is going to haircut your loan forgiveness, they give you the option of looking at a couple of periods. The, the baseline you're looking at is your eight-week period 
post loan, your covered period. And then you, you look at your FTEs during that period and you look back to one of two periods at your election, either you know the equivalent February 15 through June 30, 2019, or you could look at the average number of FTEs between January 1 and February 20, 2020. So they give you different comparison periods, figuring that you know maybe it's not apples to apples 2019 to 2020, because maybe you grew significantly. Um, so they let you look back toward the beginning of the year. That's great. All right, so let's conclude here. I wanna thank uh, both Craig Teague and, and Tom West and Orlo Connor. Uh, for contributing here. Of course, Olivia Heights on our team has been great. Uh, anyone can be in touch on email and we will make this PowerPoint and the recorded session available for sharing. Please feel free to share it as far as you'd like. We want as many clean economy entrepreneurs to get this information so they can improve their chances of survival and hopefully thriving to solve the climate crisis solution they seek to uh, achieve. So. I wanna thank everyone today and please feel free to be in touch. Our door is open. Open office is something you can sign up for. And uh, please, thanks so much and stay healthy and isolated. Bye.